Okay, hi everybody. Uh, while this is loading up, I was just gonna um, let you know that uh, the schedule for this next couple of days. So I probably have said this in class already, but just so you know, so Wednesday we got our late start day. Um, we're gonna do section well eight one Thursday section eight two, and then Friday we're gonna review eight one and eight two. So just know that both of these lessons eight one and eight two are gonna be uh, taught through video. Um, now Wednesday is obviously late start day, so you only have twenty minutes of class. Thursday is normal day, but I won't be there. So um, basically, both of these videos are gonna have homework assignments attached to them. You, they're both due on Friday. I'm not going to check one on Thursday, cause obviously, because I won't be there. So um, your basically due Friday is to watch both of these videos and then complete the homework assignments. Friday, we'll kind of go over and everything, clear up any questions that you may have, and then and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Um, so, you know, we've done all this work. By now, we've done all this work with fractions and, uh, and factoring. Um, so today, what we're, we're kind of actually doing a little sidestep, um, talking about variation functions. Um, I mentioned briefly that we're, we're going to talk about this whole chapter, so fun, uh, a, uh, you know, looking at a function where it's, we have uh, this sum function is, is equal to a fraction where we have a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom and what, how that works. Um, but we've never really put x down below yet. So that's what we're going to start with today. Um, so looking at variation functions, uh, the first variation function that we have is probably something that you should have studied in Algebra 1. It's called a, uh, it's called a direct variation, a direct variation. We're going to have a, a couple different types of variations, so make sure you write them down, make sure you understand them, and uh, uh, because you're going to need to memorize them. I will not be giving these variation formulas on the test. So direct variation. A direct variation is a relationship between two variables, x and y, that can be written in the form y equals kx, obviously where just k is not zero k was zero, then it would just be y equals zero. Uh, so it's y is equal to k times x, where k is considered this constant of variation. This k is going to stay in there for every different type of variation. Uh, that k, we're going to use um, what we what we have within the problem to solve for that k, and then and then use it again, just like we did with the half life problems, where we substituted in the k value once we had found it. That's we're going to do that exact same thing here um, now on a, just a little smaller scale. Okay. So, again, pause wherever you need to to write things down. Uh, given y varies directly as x. Now, before I even start, once I read that statement, given y varies directly as x, that's telling me that this equation is in this form. I don't even care what the rest of this, this sentence reads. All I'm saying is that since y varies directly as x, y equals kx, where k is just some number. We have to figure it out. Now, it tells us this at the end of this sentence, and y is 27 when x is 6. So y is 27 when x is 6. Well, that must mean we divide over the 6. Uh, what would that be? What's 27 divided by 6? Let me get out a calculator real quick. 27 divided by 6. Oh, duh, 4.5. 4.5 is equal to k. Okay, so that gives us our k value right away. Y is equal to 4.5 times x. And then just remember that this is just a linear equation just with no y-intercept. So my y-intercept is 0. It always runs through 0, 0. Every direct variation runs through 0, 0. And then we just go up 4.5 over 1, up 4.5 over 1, or down 4.5 left 1, down 4.5 left 1. And there's my line. Ooh, excuse the squiggle. There we go. So there's my direct variation function. It says right and graph. There's the right, there's the graph. Okay. So in terms of a word problem here, the perimeter of a dodecagon varies directly as the side length s. So without going anywhere past that, I know the perimeter varies directly as the side length k times s. Right? And when the perimeter is 18, the side length is 5, 1.5. So I know the perimeter is 18. The side length is 1.5. Oops, sorry. Oop. Um, k times 1.5. And then we divide over the 1.5. So we got 18 divided by 1.5 gets us 12, which makes sense. Like, think about that formula. Y is equal to 12 times s. Oh, that's right, because it's a dodecagon. 12 sides. So the perimeter is equal to 12 times the side length. So the perimeter is equal to 12 times. So there's my equation, right? And then it says find S when P is 75. Oops. 
when p is 75, find s. Okay, so we just take 75 divided by 12 and gets us 6 6.25 is equal to my side length, so 6.25 inches. Okay, so varying directly is multiplication, multiplication of our constant of variation times whatever it's varying directly with. Since this, is, since this case perimeter varies directly with its side length, P is equal to K times S side length. All right, now when I say two things are going to vary together, we can call that a joint variation. A joint variation is a relationship among three variables that can be written in the form y, y is equal to k times x times z. Uh, k is still the constant of variation. k is still that number that we're going to try to solve for with the given information and then use it again after we're done. Okay, and this is the wording. y varies jointly as x and z. So just to summarize, right? and that's what you're going to see in the problem. You know, if it's a word problem, you're going to see that wording. Well, y varies jointly as x and z. Okay. When I say y varies jointly, again, we're still just multiple, We're still just doing multiplication. So, uh, the volume of a cone varies jointly as the area of the base b and the height h. So that tells me right there before I even continue reading that v is equal to varying jointly with the area of the base b, k times capital B, and the height h. Okay. V is equal to K times B, capital B times H. Now then it says, if we know that 12 pi is the volume when the area of the base is 9 pi and the height is, oops, I forgot my K value. Let me just make some room. K times 9 pi times H. I have to find the K value now, right? So the rest of that st sentence is basically giving me the rest of the information that I need to solve for K. So pi's are going to cancel. And then I've got 12 is equal to 36, just the 9 times 4 times K. I divide over. 12 divided by 36 is 1 third. Oops. 12 divided by 36. 12 divided by 36. 12. Why is I keep doing 122? 12 divided by 36. Why do I? How do I keep doing this? I know that it's one third. So one third is equal to K. So volume is equal to one third area of the base times the height. Oh yeah, that's right. That's the volume of a cone formula. So volume, find B when volume is 24 pi, one third area of the base, don't know, times the height, which is nine. So 24 pi is equal to 3b, so that must mean 8 pi is equal to base, right? 8 pi feet cubed, feet squared, excuse me, feet squared, 8 pi. Okay, so again, the method is use what you know, solve for k, plug k back in, resolve. And again, remember those, those, uh, those problems that we do for half-life, that, that was the method for solving for half-life too. We, sol we solve for k, use k, plug it back in, resolve. Okay, now this last type of variation is where it ties into this whole chapter. Um, notice that if I keep, uh, take a look at this distance versus time chart here. Uh, if I keep the distance the same, you know, if you're traveling, I don't know, we're 600 miles away. I don't know, to Florida or something like that. Right? If you're traveling to like Florida and um, you, wanted, you wanted to know what, how much time is going to take you for different speeds, Obviously, if you increase the speed, the time is going to decrease, right? The more I increase my speed, the, the more my time decreases, right? If I go faster, I get there sooner. So this is not really a direct variation anymore. This is what's called an inverse variation. Uh, an inverse variation is of this form, y equals kx, or sorry, k divided by x. Obviously, again, k is not zero. We assume that k is not zero because then it would just turn out to be y equals zero. So when we put uh, the k on the top and we say k divided by x, that's, that's called an inverse variation. So as something goes up, something else is going down. Okay. For the equation y is equal to k, time, k divided by x, y, we say this, y varies inversely as x. And again, this is just to summarize everything. 
me get this kind of shifted over a little bit. There you go. Y is equal to k divided by x. Again, you're going to see that wording within the problem. Y varies inversely as x. Again, k is still our constant of variation. It's going to work the exact same way. So let's start out just without any context. Let's just pure algebra here. Uh, y varies inversely as x. Right there tells us this. Y is equal to k divided by x. Now, when it says y is equal to 4 and, k, and x is 5, that's the information that tells us our k value. So 4 is equal to k over 5. So that means 20 is my k value. So that means y is equal to 20 over x. That's our equation. Now, how do I graph that? What does that look like? Well, if we don't know what something looks like, we should make an xy table. Now let's pick, pick our numbers strategically here. Um, so say numbers that divided 20 evenly, because I'm going to take my x values and they're going to divide 20. So like, uh, let's go negative, negative 10, uh, negative 5, negative 4, negative 2. Yeah, that's a 2, folks. Um, let's pick 0 and then pick the positives. Okay. So now let's look and see what's going to happen here. If, I have, if I'm at negative 10, you know what, let me make this a little bit smaller here. Okay, if I'm at negative 10, uh, 20 divided by negative 10 is a negative 2. Uh, negative 5 divided by, or sorry, 20 divided by negative 5 is a negative 4. 20 divided by negative 4 is negative 5. 20 divided by negative 2 is negative 10. And then we've got 20 divided by 0. Well, obviously anything divided by 0 is undefined. Okay, that's going to be weird. If I take 20 divided by 2, it's going to be 10. 20 divided by 4 is 5. 20 divided by 5 is 4. 20 divided by 10 is 2. Okay, so we got this weird, funky thing going on in the middle of this graph. What in the world's happening there? Okay, well, let's take a look. Negative 10, negative 2. Negative 5, negative 4. Negative 4, negative 5. Negative 2, negative 10. Now let me scroll down just a hair. There we go. Okay, so we got this kind of curve in the third quadrant. And then in over here, we got 2, 10, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 4, 10, 2. Okay, so it looks like we've got this sort of symmetrical thing happening, one in the first quadrant, one in the third quadrant. What's actually happening is there's two parts to this. Oh, I totally missed my points, but that's okay. Two curves going on here. I did better on that one. Okay. This is uh, this is what looks like. This is what this equation looks like. You know, we've been talking about we don't know what it looks like yet when we put a variable in the denominator. This is what it looks like. You're actually going to have two tails. Why? Because there is a portion of this that is undefined. There's when x equals zero, this is undefined. What I'm actually getting here is an asymptote there. I actually also have an asymptote here as well. Um, we'll look later on in this chapter of how to actually calculate those asymptotes. Um, but I do have two asymptotes. I have a vertical asymptote and then I have a horizontal asymptote as well. It's going to get closer and closer and closer, but never reach zero on either X or Y. And the more negative I get, as soon as I turn positive, it jumps up here and then it comes back around here. You know, looking at it in, in our graphing calculator, you know, let, me, let me get out the graphing calculator so I can show you what it looks like. Because your calculator will graph this too. If I go, figure this out, uh, y is equal to 20 divided by x. Ooh, that is 200. There it is. Do you see that? So check your calculator too. To, if you're ever, you know, questioning whether you got it right or not. Plug it into your calculator, see if you got it right. So why don't you guys, oh, you're not doing another one, never mind. Um, there are going to be times when I ask you if something is a direct variation or if something is an inverse variation, and it's really easy to tell um, is if it has a k value, if k value actually exists, if the k value actually exists. Now just with a little, little sim simple uh, manipulation of the equation, if I just divide x over to the other side, that means that k is equal to y divided by x for a direct variation. And for an inverse variation, if I just multiply x over to the other side, k is equal to x times y. Um, so in a direct variation, there's a constant ratio. But in an inverse variation, there is a constant product. 
kind of counterintuitive. You would think you would multiply for direct variation, but yeah, that's true in the in the original. When we're looking for the k value, you actually divide. Same thing here in the inverse. It's kind of counterintuitive that you know you would actually multiply it, but you're you are dividing. But in the end, when you're trying to solve for your k value. I don't know where that S came from. Uh, when you're trying to find your K value, you're actually multiplying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's take a look at this here. Determine whether each data set represents direct variation, inverse variation, or neither. All right, so I've got to look at, um, you know, for a direct variation, it's going to be K over X. So let's check K over X first. Let's see what's going on here. Try not to screw up on my calculator. Oh, whoa, 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 not, not, not k over x, not k over x, stupid. Um, for direct variation, it's y over x, y over x. Basically, we're calculating the k value for a direct variation. Yeah. And then we'll, if, if we need to, we can calculate the k value for an inverse variation, if we need to. So y divided by x, okay, so we got 8 divided by uh, 6.5. So 1.23, we got 4 divided by 13. No, it's not a direct variation, right? Just because I knew that it, I saw that it wasn't the same for my second box, I can stop there, no more work needed. So let's check y times x, yeah, because that's to check for, a, for an inverse variation or x times y. Okay, so let's check uh, 8 times 6.5, 52. Let's check 4 times 13, oh, 52. Let's check 104 times 0. 0.5, half of 104, 52. So what is it? Is it direct or inverse? Well, obviously it's inverse, where my k value is 52. Yeah, so that means that I could even go, so it doesn't ask you for the equation, but you could even go so far as to say this is 52 over x. That's the equation that creates those three points. I got another one down there. Yeah. Pause and try this one. Okay, so this is direct k. This is inverse k. Remember direct, direct k is that y over x. And inverse k is that uh, y times x, or x times y. So 30 divided by 5, 6. 48 divided by 8, 6. 72 divided by 12, 6. I don't even need to check inverse. So this is actually um, direct with an equation of y is equal to 6x. Okay. Again, the only information that we really needed there was direct, but, you know. Okay, lastly, uh, combined variation. Basically, a combined variation is exactly what it sounds like. Combined variation puts everything, combines all the variations that we know. So the volume of a gas varies inversely as the pressure P. So that means P on the bottom, K on top. K is always on top. And it also varies directly as the temperature T. So T is multiplying with K. So there's our equation. That first sentence told us exactly what we need to know. Anything inverse goes on bottom. Anything direct goes on top. K will always go on top. A certain gas has a volume of 10 liters. Get that out of there. Volume of a 10 liters uh, at a temperature of 300 kelvins. So K times 300 uh, when the pressure is 1.5 atmospheres. Okay, so based on that alone, I can, def I can decide what my K value is going to be. So we've got... Um, get that out of here. Bye -bye. So 10 times 1.5. I don't know why I'm doing that because it's 15, not 150. Is equal to K times 300. So I've got 15 divided by 300. That's my K value. 0 0.05 is my K value. So I can come back in here and say Z V is equal to 0 0.05 T over P. If the gas is heated to 400 kelvins, at a pressure of one atmosphere, what is its volume? Times 400 
20. The volume is going to be 20. What does it give me? Liters. Here's my answer. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll check for the section 8.2 notes. And again, both 8.1 and 8.2 homeworks will be due on Friday. See ya.